you can't find Zacchaeus, go to Malachi. Go back to skip Malachi, and there you go. You got Zechariah right there. All right? Zechariah 9 and 9. I see some pages still turning and hear them still turning. Zechariah 9 and 9, starting back there. If you have it, say amen. It says, read, daughter of Zion, shout of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foal of an ass. And if you would now, if quickly turn to John 12. Starting at the 12th verse. Amen. If you have the word, say it. Amen. Amen. John 12 and 12. And on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Someone cried, Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, he sat thereon as it there written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold Thy king cometh sitting on the ass's coat. Now, that scripture there is, I just, we just read, Zechariah 99. So here we have here, quoted here in John 12 and 15. Zechariah prophesied 500 years before he actually went there. So here we have a prophet prophesying this. All right, if you would go to 1 Corinthians 15. And starting at verse 55. And we will settle our, our message today. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Somebody shout, victory, victory. is mine. mine. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is the word of the Lord. Today I want to talk to you about the pathway to the ultimate victory. The pathway to ultimate victory. Everybody say victory. victory. Today is just not a, another Sunday morning. Today is not just another first Sunday in which we take communion to partake and to discern the Lord's body. Oh no, this Sunday is very special. This Sunday is grand. This Sunday is significant. This Sunday is most relevant. This Sunday is one of the two Sundays of the year that m- the most celebrated Time, the most significant time in the life of the corporate church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's one of the Sundays that is most meaningful to the life of the believer. It begins what is called Passion Week or Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday. And that's no fooling. Look at somebody and say, that's no fooling. Even though April Fool's Day and Palm Sunday fall on the same day this year, it's no fooling and it's no joke that our Lord Savior came to do what he had to do. He did come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He did die on the cross for you and me. He did get up from the grave with all power in his hand. He did it all just for me. And that's no fooling. Look at somebody and say, that's no fooling. Even though 
Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday does not get all the attention that it should like Christmas. These days are most important because it was not a baby that saved me. It took a man dying on the cross that saved me. So what happened here, it took some man's job. Look at somebody and tell you, it takes a man's job to do this. And not only this, tell them it takes God to do it. Hallelujah. Moreover, this day is a day of our Lord and Savior. Make his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. This is the day that Jesus makes his ultimate journey to the cross. This is the day that marks the beginning of the end of his ministry here on earth. This is the day that he will begin to fulfill his ultimate destiny. This is the day, everybody say, this is the day that begins the most important week in the history of mankind. Since the creation of Adam and Eve, this is the day that begins God's ultimate plan for mankind. And that is that man will be reconciled Back to God. This is the day that our deliverer has come. This day our redeemer has arrived. This day our God has come to save us. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Do I have anybody excited rejoicing? Hallelujah. Say Hosanna. 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 God has come to save us. Hallelujah. Now the significance of Jesus riding on a donkey and having his way paved with palm branches is the fulfillment of prophecy spoken by the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 9 and 9, what we've just read. In biblical times, the regional custom called for kings and nobles arriving in procession to ride on the back of a donkey. The donkey was a symbol of peace. Those who rode upon them proclaimed peaceful intentions. The laying of palm branches indicated that the king or the dignitary was arriving in victory and triumph. So that's good to know. That if he came in in victory, he came in in an already victory. Now, you've heard the slogan, you've heard the saying, and it's not just as a, it's a true saying. You may be going through a situation right now, but they tell you, you can praise your way out of it. Amen? So that means that whatever you may be going through, whatever you may be facing, you can still claim the victory. When you claim the victory, you you are saying that I have faith enough in God that whatever I'm going through, I'm going to come out of it alive and with some more. So in essence, you are stating the end, what, from the beginning. I got the victory. So he came in stating that I have the victory in triumph. And we all know that Jesus would accomplish that ultimate victory. On Easter Sunday morning, when he got up from the grave, with all with the all power, with his in his hand, Hallelujah! So he has gotten us to victory. You're not getting the victory. You're not trying to get victory. You got it already. So if you facing you going on your job, and you facing calamities. You're facing a boss that may be fussing at you. You're facing people who are talking about you, putting you down. You say, I got the victory. I'm coming out of this with glory. I'm coming out of this with victory. I'm coming out of this with some substance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I want to give you a few points about this triumphal entry. This triumphal entry that Jesus went through. Just gave you a point about the donkey, about how he came in. It was 
as royalty. Number one, and you can write these down because this will be pertinent to your life. Jesus came with purpose. Somebody say purpose. He came with a purpose. He was created. He was born with purpose. God said it in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he came, his purpose was that he would save his people from their sin. Matthew 1 and 21, his purpose. So he came there with a purpose. Notice you don't see in the scripture where Jesus came in high and mighty and proud or even riding on a horse per se. If he had rode on a horse, that would state that he came in to conquer. He came in a military fashion. But no, he didn't come in that manner. He came with a purpose in mind. And his purpose was each and every one of us that he had in mind. Jesus knew who he was. He didn't have to have anybody to declare who he was. He knew who he was. The father had already declared to him who he was. He's the son of God. Even from the beginning of time, God has set the thing already in motion. When Adam and Eve, God knew that Adam and Eve would break the law. So as soon as that happened, he began to start to fashion a plan to redeem man back to himself. He did it through 44 generations, through 30 years of being on the earth, three years of being on, on of ministry for Jesus Christ. He created through all that time. So when Jesus came, he came with a purpose. He knew who he was. He didn't, ha he didn't have an identity crisis. He didn't have an emotional complex. He wasn't trying to find himself. He knew who he was. He knew what he had to do. That's why, see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't trip him up. They tried to use his own word that he had spoken and try to trip him up with. But knowing they didn't know, they, they were talking to the word right in the flesh. So he came with purpose. The lesson for us is God has made us. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he has created each and every one of you with purpose. Everybody say purpose. You have a purpose. You have a purpose in which God wants to fulfill through you. God wants to do a great thing in you. You don't, some of you here, you haven't even tapped in what God has for you. You, you haven't even tapped in a quarter to what he has for you. Even psychologists and psychologists even talk about when they talk about the brain. They said, we don't use as half of the brain that we have. There's more in us. If they can say that, what about God who has created us? Some of you got dreams right now. You sitting on the shelf. Some of you got visions right now. You've seen and said, oh, that's not going to come to pass in my life. You even, you doubt your own self. You're like the children of Israel. You doubt God and you say, oh, yes, I, God has given me the promised land. But yet I come over crying and say, we're not able to go into this promised land. Something that God has given you, but yet you doubt yourself because you see giants in the way. And you count yourself as a grasshopper. Look at, some, look at yourself and say, I'm not a grasshopper. Hallelujah. So you have purpose. You have vision. You have dreams. You got things that are in you. Why take it to the grave? 
Jesus had a purpose. And all that was set upon him, the sin of you and me was set upon him on Calvary. But his purpose was to save each and every one of you because God loved us so much. Hallelujah. You are not here just to live and breathe air. You're not here just to wake up, eat breakfast, go to whatever your job, and then go back home and come up and do the same routine every day. It's now, to, now time to start tapping into the purpose that God has for you. We can learn from the lesson. Jesus came in with purpose. Each and every one of you have a purpose. I don't care if you're zero to 99. If you got led life and you breathing right now, you're able to do something now. I don't care if you're sick, if you're terminally ill. God said you can, he can heal you. Do you believe that? So start today tapping into that purpose that God has for you. That dream and that vision. You need to go back to school? Go back to school. You see our apostles going back to school. Got his bachelor's, working on his master's. And I pray you working on your doctors. That's an example right there. So that gives you hope. Go back. That business, you got, a biz, you got a dream for a vision for a business, start going for it. Start going for it. I'm going to speak into your life. God, start going for it. I went to, we went to a business just yesterday. These ladies had a vision for a, 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 to have a, a soul food kitchen. It has expanded and it's great and it's flourishing and it's here in Zachary. Just go down there by the Papa John's down there. That's where it is. I'm giving them free advertising. The ladies that created, they have passed away, but some of their siblings have taken the vision on. Listen. You got things in you that people were able to take on. Look at Abraham. God told him that you would be a father of many nations. And God had to make, he told him that, but yet he didn't live to see it all. But yet his vision came out. And what it has happened was, the children of Israel, what we have today. That was his vision and that was God's people. Came out of his lines. And he wasn't too old in which, he's, in which God fulfilled that vision. You know the story. 99 years old, almost 100, got a child. If God said about something that will happen, it shall come to pass. Everybody say, it shall come to pass. If God has said something about you, if he has clearly said something about you, it shall come to pass. Hallelujah. So that's the hope that you should bank on. He came with purpose. Say with me, I have a purpose. Glory to God. Number two, Jesus came with humility. Jesus did not ride on a donkey with a lot of generated fanfare. The fanfare came from the crowd. He did not come in all prideful with his chest all stuck out saying, I'm King Jesus. No, he came in as the humble, meek lamb that had been predicted 500 years before. Meek and lowly. In fact, Jesus came in to the earth, meek and lowly. He didn't come in with riding on a cloud. 
in all his array. Now, you know, Jesus, he is sitting on the right hand of the Father. He could have called angels, legions of angels, to come to his rescue. But no, he didn't want that. And if you read in his scriptures, you see all the time where he does not want to be exposed. He healed the blind man's eyes. Tell him, don't go tell everybody that what has happened. But yet the man was so excited he went and told anyway. You see that all the time. Humble, meek. He was born in a manger. Manger is what? A trough in which they drink water, which the horses would drink water out of. He was wrapped up in milk rags. Not in swaddling clothes, they say that's milk rags. Came from the cows. That's where he was wrapped up. But he was born in a manger out in the country. So he came in meek and lonely, without any fanfare at all. And he came the same way he came into Jerusalem. Now, the problem was the people thought he was coming in to save them from Roman rule. Because at that time, Israel had been oppressed by the Romans. And the Romans were, you know, this big uh, superpower at the time. Going around conquering different nations, things of that nature. They thought they, he, we got us now a king that's going to come in and save us from this, these Romans. But this type of salvation that Jesus was coming in for was to save us from our sins. He was to be the reconciler, the redeemer of us all. Amen? Paul put it like this in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He was saying that we should have this same type of mind in which this is what he did. He said, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Look at that. He was so humble and meek, he didn't want to be even equal with God. Even though he was God. All right. But made himself of no reputation. I didn't want any business cards. I don't need uh, uh, my website up. I don't need anything on Facebook or MySpace. I don't need an email address. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself him the form of a servant. Okay? And it was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So he did it all just for me. When I think about the things that I've been through, the things that I've committed, the, the, the horrendous things or the sins that I, have been in my life, and I think about that of the cross and how he died and how he suffered all for me. Sometimes I have to shed a tear. I say, Lord, I thank you for what you've done for me. He came in humble. And I love this verse in Romans 5 and 8 where he said, God can commended his love toward us in which while we were yet yes. sinners yes. meaning while I wasn't even thinking about a God I didn't care whether he existed now this is not me now but it may have been some of you I may have been juking and jiving in the club I may have been going to the ballroom I may have been out there on the street 
I might have been peddling whatever I may have been doing, going from house to house or something of that nature. Y'all can read between the lines. But yet God did it all for me. I was broke down, busted, disgusted, and didn't even know it. But yet God did it and died for me. He took the lashes for me. He took his beard being ripped off his face for me. Being so disfigured on his face just for me. They whipped him with 39 lashes. Now, I ain't talking about the whippings like uh, old people. Y'all remember the whippings y'all got with a belt or maybe a, with one of them. No, I ain't talking about them kind of whippings. I'm talking about a whipping which each of the little parts of the whip has claws on them. And it was ripping his flesh off his body. He took it all that for me. So I don't have any business. I don't have any business worrying about doing any sin and things of that nature. I don't have any business. I shall be praising God all the days of my life. Because you rescued me. You set me free. And now I'm whole and I'm delivered. We got a problem in the body of Christ. We're spending too much time entertaining one or another. Instead of being about the business of Jesus Christ. We got a dying world out there that is sick. Our world is constantly sick. But yet we fight them one among another. God has called us to holiness and living right. The fight is out there, not in here. And I say it all the time. We are living in volatile times. We're living in the, the last days. We're living in the last times. We don't have time to be playing around with the devil. Jesus has set it free. He has set them in motion and everything. All we got to do now is walk in victory. All we got to do now is just believe God, praise God, amen, and start ministering out to this lost world out here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So it is time. It is even like Paul said, he said it's high time that we now get our stuff in order. You see the stuff on the news? Look at the government that's doing all this kind of stuff. Look at the government even down there in Baton Rouge, down there in downtown. All these things that are going on. People, we killing one another. We are killing one another. The drug habit, the methanes, the cocaine, the marijuana, all this junk. And not only that, you wouldn't believe it. It's creeping up in the school system. Guns being brought to school. Drugs, pills. Kindergartners carrying this stuff. It's terrible. We, as the saints of God, and I, I'm just, I just got off the paper here. We are saints of God. We have got to now start getting on our knees and start praying unto God, holding our hands to the hands of the altar, seeking God so that God will be in the midst of us. If we're going to worship God, we need to worship him in what? Spirit and in truth because he is a spirit. You got to get where God is. You can't worship God in your flesh. God will not. Flesh and spirit, they are like oil and water. They don't mix. Just like light and darkness. Jesus came as the light. But they couldn't receive him because the world was full of what? Darkness. So they can't mix. So it's time now to start getting our life in order. Start, getting, start reading the Bible, not just for religion, but really because I have to, but really because I love God. Start praying because I love God. 
start seeking the face of God because I love God. Amen? The things that we do that we get close to God, no, God, Jesus said it this way. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. Some of them been trying to come to God through Buddha, come to God to, uh, uh, con- uh, through, our, uh, uh, through other religions. Even these so-called Christian religions. They don't mean a hill of beans. Because if you have not declared Jesus as the son of God, then you do not believe in nothing. You can do all you want to do. You can come knocking on my door all you want to. But if you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God, it's all in vain. Amen? So therefore, he came with humility. Humble. That's what we need to be, humble. You can't lift yourself up. If you humble yourself before the Lord, he will do the lifting. When you humble, this is what Jesus was doing. Jesus was humbling himself before the Father. Notice that when he talked, he he says some, I do not do what I do only if my father tells me to. He did not exalt himself. He always acknowledged the father. So he humbled himself before God. This is what we need to do. We need to humble ourselves before God. Humble him because God has the way of promotion. He has the way of placing you where you have to. Sometimes we get ahead of him. We try to manufacture something. But it's not God. Abraham learned that the hard way. He tried to manufacture the promised child. But the promised child had to be a God-ordained thing. A, uh, Hagar, Ishmael was a man thing. But Isaac was a God thing. Ishmael was the, he represented the flesh. Isaac represented the promise. So therefore, when you try to manufacture something and it's not God ordained, then therefore it's liable to stumble and not to be successful. When you try to manufacture yourself to get on the next level of the job, it's not God ordained because you trying, I'm not saying you specifically, but just to give hypothetically answer, if you try to manufacture or do things that are not God ordained, like pulling somebody else down, like manipulating your own resume. But when God does it, you may not be even qualified for it. He just put the favor on you and put you in a position. And maybe this, You may not be, he may have given it to you, but you're not ready to receive it right now. Check out David. David was anointed to be king some 30 years before he actually took the throne. David wasn't exactly ready to take the throne yet. 
but he was anointed. The anointing oil fell upon him. You may be, yes, God has called me to preach, but you just got saved yesterday. No, you need to go through some stuff. You need to experience some things so that you may tell somebody what they can make it of what you've been through. So God may be just waiting, putting you in the waiting room. He put, may be just putting you there, just put, putting you in the hot room. Meaning that you maybe had to go through some things. You had to cry some tears. You may have to do this. You may have to sit in that position just for a while. God may be just sitting you in that position because somebody else may be needs help in that position. God has a way. Always has a way. But the key of it is that he has it for you. There's no doubt about it. If you desire that position, God will set you up in it. He'll do it. All you got to do is just be humble. Just be humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will bring you to where he has to place you. Amen. Now, number three, I'm moving on. They celebrated him and they opposed him. They celebrated him on Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the king who come in the name of the Lord. Then down here Thursday, Friday, crucify him, crucify him. Kill him. String him up. The same crowd that celebrated him. Laying palm leaves in front of him. Shouting Hosanna. Hosanna. Was the same crowd that later on in the week would turn on him. Shouting crucify him and crucify him. They thought they were getting a king that would help them get from the Roman rule, like I said before. Just like what John 1 and 11 said. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him not. But to tell you the truth, that gives me a little good news. Because he came to his own, which was the children of Israel, the Jews. But his own people didn't even receive him. But that gave me a good news because I'm a Gentile. So that, it, that allowed me to just walk on in. And just received of him. So I became engrafted into the royal family. You didn't receive him? Okay, I'll receive him. He ain't done so much for me. I receive him. But the lesson is, they turned on him. Okay? They turned on. The lesson for us today, and this lesson is, you can't trust any and everybody. Now, they, now don't get me wrong. There is a level of trust that you need to have. For certain people, you know, I mean, your true friends, your your husband and your wife, you need y'all need to trust. I mean, your true friends. That mean there's a level of trust there. But don't get so caught up in the celebrating part when people celebrate you, when people they hailed you. Because down that road somewhere, that's where the true test of their friendship going to be. It's whether they oppose you. That's where it's going to be. 
All right? So the lesson, it, uh, even Jeremiah picked it up and he said, cursed be the man that trusted in man and make it flesh his own. He said, cursed be. This is the key of it, of it all. God has glory. Everybody say glory. glory. Say glory again. Glory. Now, gl God is about his glory. And he takes great, he takes, I mean, he holds on to his glory. God wants all the glory. All the glory belongs to God. All right? He took it even to the point when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The first one is said, Thou shall have no other gods before me. Even in the back of time, before even time existed, Satan tried to exalt himself. Just as soon as he tried to do that, before God, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Just as soon as he tried to exalt, boom, he was gone. So God, he takes great thing of his glory. All right? That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. That's why he had to be a man wrapped up in God, in flesh, that had to come down, that didn't know no sin, that he had to die on the cross. Because it was a God thing. If it was a man thing, then like in uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, lest we should boast, lest we should get all the glory, lest we should do this. No, it was a God thing. So God takes great strength in his glory. So meaning that we should to put our total trust in God. Because God knows all, he sees all, he has all, he knows the end just from the beginning. He knows it all. He knows about your life. He knows what you're going to do when you leave church. He knows what you're going to do when you get on that job on tomorrow. He knows. He knows it all. That's why you should put your complete trust in God. Trust in the Lord with what all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Don't lean on what you think you already know. Don't even lean on that. But put your trust in God. And he will lead you in the right path. And another thing too, we need to take the clamps off of God. Take the clamps off of him. We think God should come in this way. We think God should show up in this way. No, God may come in through a donkey and tell the man of God to turn this way. God comes in many different forms. We got to take the limits off God. We think God should come in where well, somebody should lay my hands on it and they should be healed. Yes, they could be do that. But God, he may hear you in, in the hospital room. He may hear you at home. He don't have to be at church for God to heal you. God is everywhere. Everybody say, God is everywhere. God is in your bathroom. God is in your kitchen. God is in your bedroom. God is on your street. God is in your car. He's everywhere. So don't put any limits on him. Take your limits. He let him do the exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we even ask or think. What does that mean? Whatever you ask, God can do even more than that. If you're abiding in him, yes, he can make you whole. I'm, I'm, I'm believing God for a million, he can give me ten. And I don't have to play the lottery ticket to see if I can get six hundred and forty million dollars. God can do it. Do you believe that? Do I got anybody to believe that God can do it? Got any believers up in the house? Up in here? Look at somebody and say, I believe God. God can do the miraculous. 
God can do the greater beyond that you even ask or even think. Beyond your mindset. Beyond a school system. Beyond a, a governmental system. God is beyond that. I'm talking about God. Hallelujah. So he can do in your life. I want you to leave here today. If I ain't said nothing, you ain't heard nothing I said. I want you to believe that God can do whatever the desires that you have in your heart that he can do. Whatever desire you got that God given to he. What the scripture say? Psalms 34 and 4. He giveth the desires of thy heart. He said God will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in him. That means to get all in. Y'all got some favorite food, huh? Mine is lemon meringue. Mine is peach cobbler. I... And when I eat that, I said, Lord, thank you. That's the way God wants us to get in him. So, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. Oh, you're so good. You better than this ice cream. Hallelujah. He said, delight yourself in him. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. Hallelujah. That's good. I like when David said, he said, all you got to do is just taste. You ain't got to eat the whole thing, just taste. <laughs> that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. You just got to taste it. He give you a little taste. And you know he's good. He woke you up this morning. He provided you with a strength of, a strength in your limbs. You was able to brush your teeth, comb your hair. I know we take that as trivial. But look, there are a lot of people that can't do it. A lot of people don't even have their right mind. But you got your right mind. He's good. Hallelujah. Praise God. My, 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 my. Let me move on. Just one more. Hallelujah. Woo, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, he entered in that led to my victory. This week, and like I said before, you know, Christmas don't, Christmas get all the attention. Even, you know, from the world, they make songs and make albums and do all kinds of stuff. They presents and Christmas trees, lights and stuff. Uh, cantatas, candlelight visuals, all for Christmas. But Lord, when we get to Easter, you know, they got the bunny rabbit and all that, Egg, Easter egg on, all that. I mean, but yet, but yet, this is the most important time. Because Jesus came in, yes, he came as a baby. But he couldn't die on a cross as a baby. He had to be a man. And this was the pinnacle time. If you're a believer of God, I mean a true believer. I'm not talking about a, 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 a just a facade. What, you know, when they talk about puppy love. Not that kind of believer. A rain or shine believer. Okay? No. I'm talking about through thick and thin. 
through hell and high water, through mess, circumstance, type of believer. I'm talking about them kind of believers. All right? That's going to stick with him through thick and thin. When the going gets tough and the tough get going. That kind of believer. But he came in with my victory. If you're a believer, this is a very excited time. On Sunday, he ended in as a donkey. Victorious. Monday, on tomorrow, Lord willing, we still here and the Lord hadn't came back. He began to clean house in the temple. What's that telling us? I don't know if you know it or not. I don't know if you can see through your spiritual eye or not. But God is doing some cleaning in the, in the house. In these house, in these times, in these days. God is exposing these so-called false prophets. These people who have been leading people to hype, but not giving them substance in which to live on. I'm going to tell you this. Hype will not save you. You know, you can only go so far in your, get, in your uh, car they tell me that when it gets on E, that you got two gallons left in your car. Some of us, we've been riding on E for a long time. And we're going off the fumes. Don't, wait, don't let it get cold, because you sure going to be out. That's what people have been riding on. We've been riding on fumes. The church, the people, believers have been riding on fumes. Preachers and Pastors and so-called evangelists been preaching out fumes to people and not giving them substance. Telling them that you're going to come out of this. You're going to, you believe God for this. Put your hand on it, name it and claim it and kind of stuff. But not having been teaching them how to live, how to get along with my wife, how to get along with my husband, how to treat my children, how to get along with my job. I'm talking about Substance. So Jesus came on Monday cleaning the house saying, this is a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. This is a house of prayer. You should make not only this house, but your house as a house of prayer. Prayer should be around in your house constantly. Prayer for your children. Prayer for your husband. Prayer for your wife. Prayer over your finances. Prayer over the water that runs through the pipes so that my pipes won't burst. Prayer over my washing machine. Prayer. The spirit of God. When prayer comes, God comes in the midst. Because I'm talking about prayer. Somebody say prayer. On Tuesday, this is what happened. The Pharisees, Sadducees start... They are confused and saying, who, who is this guy here? And they start getting in, they start getting mad to the point they start conspiring on how to get rid of them. Wednesday, the conspiracy is brewing. They even got to the point, they decide, oh, we're going to get one of his disciples to mess him up. Some of us, we all have a Judas in our camp. But this is what I like about what Jesus did. He didn't, he didn't come against him. He didn't call the man his friend. He just humbly went on and accepted him. He, de he deceived him. On Thursday, Jesus eat his last supper. And that's what we partake in today. Remembering of what he did. Of the Lord's body. And the actual betrayal began. The arrest takes place. Jesus is arrested. 
Now, like I said, Jesus could have called his angels to get those soldiers, but no. That's why I said he had a purpose. He knew what he had to do. So he had to go through these things. He wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, should, should I do it? Is it your will that I should do this? Even to the point that he swept blood. Now, can you just imagine the agonizing, the agony? Now, I, I sweat. Some of you know, we sweat. We're working hard or outside or something of that nature. But he's, Jesus sweat blood. How agonizing is that? But he did it for you and me. I like it where it says in Hebrew. 13. And I'm paraphrasing. Jesus went to the cross, but he saw it was a joy to him because he saw us. A joy of going to the cross because he, because he thought about us. How beautiful that is. Hallelujah. Friday, you know the story. He, they crucified him, buried him, but he did it all for my victory. On Sunday, somebody say Sunday. Sunday. Somebody say Sunday morning. Sunday morning. He, got he got up with all power. In his hand. So what that's telling me. He got up. Now I can get up. Of my despair. Of all that he been through. I can get up. Paul put it like this. He gets up. Now since Jesus has gotten up. Romans 6 and 4. You cannot get up. In the newness of life. He said I come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. Thanks be unto God. Who has given us the victory. Through our Lord. Jesus Christ. He entered in. For my ultimate victory. Now I am free. Now I am delivered. Now I am made whole. Now I have the newness of life. Now I got the life that he promised me. Now I'm reconciled back to God. Now I'm saved. Now I'm sanctified. Now I'm filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Now all my needs are met. Now I'm healed. By his stripes I am healed. Now I can not only make it. Not only I can not only survive, but I can am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ that has loved me. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the country. I'm blessed in the field. I'm so blessed that my blessings chasing me. They're chasing me over. All because of what Jesus did. All because he was sitting riding on a donkey. He came in victorious. He left rising up victorious. Now I'm set free. Somebody says set free. Hallelujah. And this is the word of the Lord. Stand to your feet.